Welcome to Train Signal. I'm Ross Bagertis, and in this video we're going to introduce dynamic routing. Now, so far we've looked at static routing. When we looked at building the routing table, we looked at how to create routes in order to make a simple network like this work. And what we did was, as the network administrator, we looked at from the perspective of the router we're configuring. So if we were configuring router 1, we looked at router 1 and said, what networks does router 1 not know how to reach by default? Right? We know how to reach network 10.0.1.0 slash 24 because it's directly connected to fast Ethernet 00, 0 here. We know how to reach 172.16.10.0 slash 30 because it's connected to F0 slash 1 on the other side. So our router knows how to reach both of those. However, by default, our router does not know how to reach any other networks. As we found out, it did not know how to reach 192.168.10.1. So what we had to do was we had to configure router 1 with a static route to say, hey, if any packet comes into router 1 with a destination address of 192.168.10.0, then let's route that to 172.16.10.1, which is the F01 interface on router 2. So we say send all that traffic to get to 192.168.10.0 over to router 2 which it does, and then we can send traffic from this device over to this device. But what that doesn't allow is it doesn't allow the other device, 192.168.10.10, to respond to us over here on our other network. So then on router 2, we have to do a mirror of what we just did on router 1 in order to tell router 2 how to reach the 10.0.1.0.24 network. And to do that, we're going to go to the F01 interface of router 1, which is 172.16.10.2. Well, this is fine when we're doing very granular routes or have a very small network like this. Once we have a larger network where we have redundant paths to multiple networks, now we have a different scenario going on here. So if I am an administrator and I want to set up this network so that a device on 10.0.8.0 can reach the device on 10.0.8.0, 10 0, what I would do is I would set up some static routes. Now, instead of telling you exactly what the static routes are, I'm just going to use some arrows here. And I'm going to say we need to set up a static route on router 2, pointing this direction to router 1, in order to get from 10 0 8 0 to 10 0 10 0. However, in this particular setup, I can take this path from router 2 to router 1, but I can also take a path from router 2 to router 3, and then from router 3 to router 1 in order to reach 10, 0, 10, 0. But which path do I take? Well, it's up to you as the administrator to figure that out. And if you want, you can actually set up two paths to the same network. Well, I also need a reverse path. Remember, I have to set up the path then from 10, 0, 10, 0 to get back to 10, 0, 8, 0. So I can do that here by establishing another route on router 1, pointing in the direction towards router 2. And then to follow up this way, I can complete my path by putting static routes from router 1 to router 3, and then router 3 to router 2 to reach 10, 0, 8, 0. What happens now when packets get routed is if I allow this in its default state, what's going to happen is something called asymmetric routing. And what will happen is the first packet will go out from router 2 to router 1, and the second packet that hits router 2 will go from router 2 to router 3, and then router 3 to router 1. So I'm constantly sending traffic back and forth through different paths over my network. You really don't want this, because we have no idea in this drawing how fast these links are, one, so we may end up actually having slow links in some spots where it could delay the traffic from reaching the endpoint in a timely manner. Worse yet is if this user calls the help desk and starts complaining, where do we look for the problem? Do we look through the problem on this link, on this router, on router 3, on router 1, on one of these other links? We don't know where to look for the problem because our traffic is taking all these different possible paths. The second issue that comes up is router 2 is completely ignorant to the behavior on the rest of the network because we set it up that way. As a static route, when we're setting up static routes, 
and we're looking at it from the perspective of router 2 here, we have to know where all the other networks that we want to route to are, but what we don't know about is what all the paths available are to those different networks unless we look at a network diagram. So if this network fails, router 2 static routes remain there. We still have a route going up to router 1. We still have a route going over to router 3. Except since the link is down between router 1 and router 3, every packet that router 2 sends to router 3 gets dropped. So we end up losing half of our traffic to our workstation up here that we're trying to send traffic to. So this is where dynamic routing becomes incredibly valuable because what dynamic routing does is it gives us a protocol to allow the routers to communicate with each other in order to alert each other when these events happen, when a network link goes down, and how we can reroute packets in a different way.